Hey, everybody. Hey, I hope you're having a great day wherever you are in the world. Now, look, Tay's episode, I think you're going to love. I certainly had a good time recording it. Um, he's a best-selling author. This guy, uh, I'll tell you. Um, normally, I don't, I don't rev- do the reveal until later, but I'm going to go ahead and, and do it at the top of this episode because it's important. Um, today's guest is a guy named Orrin Claff. Now, Orrin wrote Pitch Anything. You'll hear us talk about his methodology. I have been – this been, book's been recommended to me a couple times. Now, I'm kind of sick of reading these kind of books. I've read them for decades. I finally broke down, got this one, and I listened to it on Audible. And then listen to it again. It has helped me reformulate, reorder my pitch. And, and just to set the table with you here, um, pitching is not selling. And Orrin and I talk about that a little bit. Pitching is not selling. Pitching is one and done. You go in. You make your case. This is my, my, my big idea. This is how I'm going to do it. Here's, here's up to you. Boom, done. And he also will say that you shouldn't close. Your pitch should be so mesmerizing that at the end, you just go, hey, look, guys, thanks for your time. I got to leave. And you know what they're going to, and your prospect, the person that you're pitching, is just going to say, hey, sign me up. Okay. So, so anyhow, now I, I have listened, I did the, uh, Warren's again, interesting guy. He happens to be here in San Diego. I went down and, I, and played around in his studio, which was cool. He had, a, you know, he does a show himself. Um, and I and I roll in there, and the guy's got in the studio. He's got a a, def, a, a Land Rover Defender One Hundred and Ten. You can't even get them, you know. You can't get them smogged here. Gorgeous car. We walk into another big part of his of his office. He's got an Audi R Eight and like fifteen super rare motorcycles. So, so definitely a guy like I I, I dig what he's doing out there. Um, and look at the here's the end of the at the end of the day. Orrin's whole thing is how to get people to say yes. So I want you to listen to this. Um, um, you're going to hear something a little bit funky uh, in the beginning at the top of this is I, I, I use some of his techniques to, int- to introduce him, right? Because I did an introduction there to you guys. And, uh, and I, I say, hey, you know, Warren's got this secret formula. And he goes on to, to say, hey, Toby, you know, you can get a, a formula for a math problem or, or an, an engineering problem, but not necessarily uh, social stuff. And, and it's so, I mean, listen, I, I almost feel embarrassed now because I listened to it again and I realized that he was disagreeing with me. He, he, he was saying, you sh- Toby, you shouldn't have called this a formula. And I didn't pick up on it. So, but that's okay. That's all right. Cause I, I, I do believe if you get his book, pitch anything, there is a formula to this and maybe him and I are just defining formula a little bit differently. All right. Hey, listen, guys, I, I think this is going to be one for the books. Let me know. Uh, how you feel about it. Um, let Oren know. Uh, and uh, here we go. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Before we get there, guys, quickly, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, hopefully, you're going to like Oren's episode. Um, what I'd love for you to do, I rarely ask this, but uh, but um, I'd love for you to go to superagentslive.com. Find the show on iTunes. I, I, I don't ask for reviews. I'd love to, for you to give me and the show a review. It helps out. We've been getting a lot of new listeners lately that are just finding the show. A lot of people you know, recommend this show to, to their buddies. Um, I don't sell anything to you guys. I do this for free. But if you could help me, go give me a review uh, or give the show a review. Uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and again, w- you can go to iTunes or Stitcher or access those platforms through the site superagentslive.com. Um, and as usual, you know, look, you know, this whole show is funded through our radio arm, uh, Real Estate Radio Experts. So if you want to level up, if you want to get listing leads, radio, baby, radio. And I'd love to pitch you guys. I would love to pitch you guys. I might, I might, at the, I'll tell you what, you know what I'm going to do? At the end of this, 
I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make you guys go through this right now. But I'm gonna give you my pitch for radio. After you listen to me and Oren talk about pitching and how to do it, we talk about intrigue loops. I'm gonna record my pitch to you. Um, so uh, if you want to bear, so now this show's gonna go from 55 minutes long to maybe an hour 10 or 15. Um, so if you want to bear through my pitch, I'd love to get your feedback. All right, let's get to it. Some of you out there right now are listening to this while you're driving to work, walking your dog, or riding your bike. You're probably thinking about your business. What if I told you I had a secret formula, a magic blueprint that by using it, you could close every deal that comes across your desk, captivate every prospect you need? Well, today's guest has spent 10 years developing this type of formula. He's worked with scientists, psychologists, sociologists, to create this secret formula. I'm here today with best-selling author, Oren Claff, and master pitchman. His book, Pitch Anything You Have to Get. Hey, Oren, thanks for taking the time out today. Toby, great. It's good to, uh, good to meet with you. And yeah, I mean, formula is an interesting word because I have an engineering background and uh, you know, when we're engineers and we're people in the physical world and we do real estate and we do things like that, uh, they, we can do math and we can do formulas. But when it comes to social stuff, right, getting people to say yes, getting people to want to do your deal, getting people to reply to your emails, getting people excited about the project you have, that's all on the social side. And there's no real math or formula or calculus that seems to work. And so I spent so many years trying to figure out something that's predictable. Right, uh, uh, because when you're in engineering and when you're real estate, and when you're doing a spreadsheet, or when you're doing cap rates and IRRs and ROIs and uh, uh, you know split between debt and equity and submitting an application to a to a lender, those are all fixed knowledge kinds of activities, right? Uh, and they're very formulaic. But on the social side, uh, there don't seem to be good formulas. So I spent right. a long time. Right, working. absolutely, and 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 this, you know. You have formulated everything. So the first thing I want to talk about, and, and what I found interesting in your book was, you know, I, I'm typically a pretty charismatic guy. I go into pitch a room, and I can, I, can, I, can, the, I can watch the crowd. I can keep them captivated. However, there's a difference between keeping them captivated and, and keeping their attention. So there's a specific – talk to us about length of pitch. Because, yeah. because uh, let, me, let me have you set the table in this way. Yeah. You named your book Pinch Anything. Instead of sell anything. So, right now, what's the difference between a pitch and selling? Great. I mean, you're very tuned into this space because very few people will ask that question. They kind of equate pitching with selling. You know, selling to me is when you have repeat bites at the apple. All right. So, a, not to pick on anybody, but a copier salesman, right, can go in and say, hey, and they can build a relationship and they can say, here's the specs on the Xerox 32Z. And the client might say, you know, we don't need it, but we're looking out. Uh, in September on making a change. You go, oh, I'll call you then. Maybe I'll sell you some paper in the mean build a relationship, many approaches. You know, that's selling. Uh, and and pitching is really one shot. That's the world I come from. Real estate would be hundreds of millions of dollars in real estate transactions. So when you go into an investor or a bank and you pitch a real estate deal, they never say, you know what? That was very interesting. I don't think we're going to be buying uh, you know, this deal until maybe September. Why don't you come back then? Because deals have a shelf life, and investors are yes or no. It's binary. They never say maybe. Right. And if they do say maybe, it's a no. Right. All right. So pitching is when you have one opportunity to go in, make your case, and ask for progress. And if there's no progress, you're done. Selling is a relationship building, long-term um, uh, sort of a framework that is totally different. Now, sometimes you know, salespeople end up in a, in a do or die, this is the final pitch, yes or no, but largely that's a different field. And I'm not sure I know that much about selling. I'll carry a bag, have a book of business. I go in to guys who don't know that much about me or the deal. Sometimes you walk in and they go, remind us what your name is, what you're doing here, and what you have. And that's your starting point. That's a pitch. You know, selling, the other way you can look at it is selling, a lot of times you're addressing a real need, right? So, um, uh, you know, if we have this building, if we have a problem with the HVAC, we need to buy a new HVAC, and we have, we have a need, we have to fix the air conditioning, right? And so we have to, a salesman come in and we have to pick one of them. 
That's very different. In pitching, you know, when you pitch an investor, when you pitch a deal, the buyers don't really have a need, right? They want to put money out or they want to do a real estate deal, but they don't have to buy it. Um, they don't, they don't, not trying to accomplish something specific. And so a pitch has a whole different set of requirements, a different kind of buyer. And so these are two very different things. Absolutely. Okay. So let's, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. Yeah. So pitching multiple times at bat and you know, when people, I'm sorry, selling multiple times at bat and people think about, oh, rapport building relationship, pitching, forget that. Forget yeah. about rapport. It's, it's, maybe we sum it up like this. In selling, a maybe can really be a maybe. Yeah. Right? May, maybe now, maybe next week, maybe next month. Yeah. Right. A pitch, and, and yes or no, one and done. And maybe is no. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So we know, and the reason why I want to bring that up, Warren, is because, again, 85% of my audience are real estate people, and, and that's what they do. They, they, call, you know, they prospect all day, they get an appointment, and they're, they're up to bat. And yeah. that, when you walk out of there, they're going to list with you or not, typically, right? So it's yes or no. Okay. Right. So now let's talk about that timeline, the length. What is the ideal length? I go in to pitch you. I'm gonna, I, I, want you, I want to sell your house, right? So do I have an hour? Do I have, how long should that pitch be? So the, the easy answer and the way I wrote it in the book is the span of human attention is 20 minutes. If you are a, like yourself, articulate, dynamic, charismatic, and you have a well-organized pitch framework. Even the, you know, you say, uh, you know, I can see that you have all the tools and you're as you know, dynamic and structured and articulate as it gets. And I would say for you or myself, don't go past, past 20 minutes. It's the span of human attention. You cannot go past that. All right? If you're weaker right, or you don't have as much experience, you've got to scale back from there. I would say some people, they, they should not pitch longer than four or five minutes. And this would boil down to only pitch as long as you can be compelling. Right. Right. Once you stop being compelling, both in the information and in the delivery, you've got to stop pitching and, and go back to you know, having a meeting. It's not to say meetings last five minutes, right? but when you go, okay, everybody settle down. I'm going to tell you what we have, the big idea, what it is, why do it today, what the economics are, what our assumptions about the deal or the listing or the property or the real estate market is who we are, what our track record is, the upside, the downside protection, and the timeline. You know, all that goes in a pitch. And, and uh, you know, some people starting off should only be five minutes long. Get all of that in there. But 20 minutes is the span of human attention. You can't. But, but, but I think there is, uh, I think there's a, a to layers of the onion or a deeper way to look at that, right? So, when you f what I find is real estate people, when they first get somebody on the line, they feel so excited and a little bit of desperation. They give the whole pitch before it's been asked for. So I guess, um, you know, after I wrote the book, you know, we've had some additional realizations, which is sort of there's a, there's a six-minute pitch, and then there's a 20-minute pitch, and there's probably a one-minute pitch, right? So, so when you get somebody on the phone, you sort of don't want to uh, open all the cages and release all the hounds. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that's, that's, that's a little bit, and I don't want to get, go down that path, but that's a little bit like a tactic. You always want to sort of hold something back, keep them wanting for more, right? And yeah. you, you address wanting. But so for that, just, just to cement this, this notion of the length, so maximum attention span is 20 minutes for humans. For sure. And now, what you said, some people's pitch may be five minutes. So, so to, to, to unpack that or to cement that idea, in the book, you, you tell a story about Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. So to talk about that that. I think that that's great, uh, and I can't remember exactly how I told it, but I'll tell it. You know how sure. I I know it today. Uh, so Jerry Seinfeld, after he finished the show, said, "I'm going to go back out on tour," and so he started learning material. And comedians, you know, they build up material uh, uh, 20 seconds at a time, and their aspiration is really just to get three quality minutes of material. And so Jerry Seinfeld, you know, builds up a little material. He goes out on stage and he goes to a little club. Uh, somewhere in uh, uh, North, Pennsylvania or New York, you know, some remote area. And he is the biggest celebrity that's ever stepped foot in this town by orders of magnitude. He goes to a local comedy club. It fills up. Uh, and, and they've never had a bigger, bigger star. And Jerry Seinfeld at that point may be the most well-recognized uh, celebrity name in the world. And he goes up on stage. And, his, and, and what he realized is he gets a minute 
maybe two minutes of just saying anything, you know, being Jerry Seinfeld. But after two minutes, at most three minutes, he has to be really funny. His jokes have to kill it. So, so if Jerry Seinfeld, the biggest comedian that there ever has been, right? At that point, the biggest celebrity in the world gets less than three minutes of attention from a crowd before he actually has to deliver, right? How much attention do you think that you'll get if you're mediocre? Absolutely. And, and again, that's why in the book you say, don't mess around with who am I? You're trying to build a report. Just get to it. Okay. Right. So, okay. So you have three minutes. Well, nobody cares, right? Right. Nobody right. cares about who you are. Uh, um, th- that will come, right? The, the, uh, who you are, what your track record is, but everybody has great resumes. And when you say what you've done, what your resume is, it's reverse engineered, right? And I say that and I mean that you're going to say the best things about yourself mm-hmm. at the beginning. People want to know what you have and then how your background maps to what you have. And, and if these things fit and make sense, then they become excited. But it's too difficult for a buyer to hear about your background and then hear your pitch and try and combine those things into uh, a decision to buy. So first, you know, I mean, you could say a couple seconds about yourself. The big idea, the problem, you know, the solution, what you have, what the ROI is, and then map yourself to that pitch you've just told. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you, you, whether you realize or not, you, there's so much stuff there that you said. Because, because when people, and I, I really don't want to go down this path, but I'm going to address it for a second. When, when you go in there and you start to go, oh, you just came back from Florida. And my, you, know, you try to build that rapport, what you talked about in the book. And I, again, I, I'm, this is bad on me as an interview. But you know, people are naturally defensive. And, and they want to pattern make, right? right. So, so you know, when you're doing that, people are, are trying to figure you out, trying to put that pattern together. Is this guy a bad guy? He's trying to get me like, what is up? So you're bet, I think you're, and you're better off not to go down that route. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah. With your I cock, think, crock brain. I think uh, when, when you go in and, uh, and we see so many people do this, try and find rapport. This is sort of like, um, uh, you know, the 80s, kind of Donald Trump, Zig Ziglar, you know, find rapport, get them to like you. First of all, uh, nobody's going to buy what you have because they like you, right? I think a lot of the sales books say they will, but those are sales books, and somebody might buy a television, a camera, maybe a car because they like you, but a real estate deal, yeah. right? When we go to committee, right, we don't go, hey, look, we don't really like this deal. The economics aren't strong. We don't like the underwriting. But Warren's a great guy. There, but he's a great guy. <laughs> Let's do it. Right. Right? So, yeah. So... Uh, and in fact, we do a lot of deals where we don't necessarily love. I mean, we think they're honest. We think they're hardworking. We don't really like the guys, you know, personally. But we still do the deal because we think it's good real estate. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not that we dislike them. But uh, uh, liking and trust are two totally different things. Rapport. So maybe we put a cap on it. Okay. Rapport does not equal trust. If you have in your mind this idea that if, uh, if I build rapport with someone, they like snowboarding, I tell them that I like snowboarding, they love the Phillies, you know, I grew up you know, watching the Phillies, that is not going to get somebody to trust you. All right? and, and even if it gives a little inkling of trust and starts to build it a little bit, it is so time consuming. Because remember, we put a time constraint. The best guy in the world should only be pitching for 20 minutes, even if it's an hour meeting. How much time does rapport take four, five, seven minutes. I've seen guys in Silicon Valley come in and spend 20 minutes on trying to do that calibration. Who do we know? Jewish geography, skiing geography, sports team, uh, you know, liking sports team. Blow 20 minutes on it, and the investors are cooked before they've even started their presentation. Yeah. So get away from this rapport stuff and, and focus on value <clears throat> proposition and ideas that are meaningful for the buyer or the investor. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, when people pitch me and they go through that all that dance, it's tiresome. Yeah. It's boring. Yeah. Okay, so, so look. Well, well I put, right? people don't want to come to a meeting uh, with you and talk about things that they already know about. They want to learn new things about the market, where, how, where things are going. They want information from you that will let them make money. Right. Right? Uh, um, you telling them that you also like snowboarding right, does not uh, uh, help them make money. Yep. <clears throat> Nothing in the value stack there. Okay. So, so pitch 20 minutes at max. Now, now you get pitched a lot of deals. I get pitched a lot of deals. One thing that I, I just, it's just, you know, the worst thing you can do is you come to me and I, I feel like you need the deal. And a lot of like alarm bells for me start going off, especially right. when I do a bridge loan, right? Like, like you need it. Like, what are you not telling me? So, so you address this neediness in the book. 
How does, and, and again, I think with real estate agents, too many times they, they go into a million dollar listing, they're like, wow, you know, I, I, I rarely get at bat with a million dollar deal or two million dollar deal, uh, I really want it. Right. So what are some of the, the most common mistakes that people make in the projecting neediness and how do we mitigate that? Yeah. So, ne- I mean, I think th- this is for, I mean, get the book and read that chapter on neediness because it spells it out very, very specifically you know, what the needy behaviors are and what the cure for it is. But let's talk about it a little bit here. I think maybe we spend a minute talking about the root cause or the, the root reaction to neediness. So if we go back 50,000 years to when the you know, human beings were just developing into um, uh, you know, civilization, right? and there was nothing. Right? And you go back now 10,000 years and, uh, uh, and then 5,000 years. So we're very limited. So there's an axe and there's a fire and a dog. So, so Toby has very limited things. He has an axe. He's got some fire. He's got a place to sleep and a dog. And I come and I need something. That generates fear, right? Because if I take something from you, you don't have any surplus. That means you're going to have less and I'm going to have more. So whenever somebody approached our ancestors and they needed something, it immediately created fear. So the fear of neediness is in our DNA. So when you, when you communicate through your body language or more importantly your language, you need a customer, you need a deal, you need something to close, you need the listing, it immediately, uh, subconsciously, genetically creates fear and, uh, and, and people want to get away from you. So that is at a, at a, at a genetics or caveman level and that's where neediness starts. All right. Uh, but but for sure, then then if that's the beginning understanding of neediness at the other end of the scale, we know neediness kills deals, right? So when you when you tell somebody just just for example, if you're looking for a listing and you say, hey, I've had a string of um, uh, deals that didn't close, right? It's been a difficult year. This is a two million dollar listing. I, you know, and some people say I'm just being honest, right? right? <laughs> Don't qualify that you're being honest. You should be. You know, all your words should be honest. You should never qualify, of course, that you're being honest. But people say, hey, I'm just being honest. Um, I really need this deal. All right. So what it, that small communication causes a chain reaction of problems. So first of all, I think what you're telling people is that um, you have, as the listening agent, you have no resources. Right? When you need something... Right? That means you're sort of at rope's end, you don't have resources, you don't have relationships, you're not busy, and it ties into the idea that successful people are busy. Right? So when you say, um, um, I'm not busy, I need it, it communicates you're not successful. So we never want to communicate this neediness to people ever. And, and, and so um, the way to do that, of course, is to be busy. Right? And this ties back to the pitching. Right? The better you are at pitching your service, pitching your, um, you know, your deals, the busier you're going to be and the less needy that you'll ultimately. If you think about this, uh, you spend some time in Silicon Valley, this mythology of Mark Zuckerberg right, going to a venture group in a bathrobe and, and slippers. You familiar with this story? Yeah. Yep. yeah. So uh, why does he do that? Because he's got 20 other venture firms trying to give him money and he doesn't feel needy at all and he's, you know, and... and um, if they say no, he doesn't care. In fact, he wants them to say no to get rid of them so he can sort through the other 20 options that he has. When you have lots of options, you act not needy. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So uh, if, if all of a sudden you got 15 referrals all in a row, right, and, and you come in and there's all these messages, hey, call me, call me, call me, call me. The first one, you're going to say, hey, Mr. Jones, do your regular 20-minute pitch. The fifth one, you're going to start slurring your words and moving a little bit faster and maybe you know, drinking coffee while you're talking, things you normally wouldn't do. By the 20th one, you're eating a sandwich. You're telling the guy, hey, listen, I only have two minutes to tell you what I do. At the end of it, the two minutes, you're going to tell me in or out. Like You would never pitch one lead for a month that way. Right. right? Uh, but if, you, if you've got abundance and, you've got, and you're very busy, you act not needy, and that attracts people because they know you're busy. 
and you've got lots of resources. Right, absolutely. And I, and I think the, the other thing, too, Oren, is that um, even if you don't have an abundance, you can develop an abundance mindset and just and, and, and sort of train yourself not to. So, so just a, a quickly on neediness, are there, are there any kind of typical cues sure. that, that people project out that they maybe are not cognizant? Absolutely, right. So there's some tools, and, and most of the time, I am needy when I go out to that I'm, I need the deal, right? Because we we don't have uh, so if we get a special deal, right? We might not have 15, 20 investors for it, or we may have you know something change in the deal. We may only have one or two guys. When you only have one or two guys to close a deal with, you're needy by definition because you don't have lots of backups. So most of the time, you know, we find ourselves needing the investor or the buyer to come in. The um, the good thing about us is we're trained not to communicate that neediness. Now, uh, uh, so there's some tools that help, so, and I think that's where you're going. Number one is a time constraint. People who are needy will stay on the phone, will stay in a meeting, will spend as, as much time as humanly possible with the buyer. That communicates neediness. So when you say, I'm very busy, I've only got, you know, if this is a third meeting, Right? I've got to jump to another meeting, and hopefully that's true. Um, but if, even if it's not, you've got to create one and say, I've got 15 minutes here today to get through some paperwork, then I have to jump. Right? That communicates to the buyer that you're not needy. That is, is you know, a time constraint is essential. You've got a time constraint yourself. People who are not busy, people who are needy, have, have all the time in the world. Uh, so, Absolutely. You know, so that's one for sure. And I think the other thing, kind of, so so that's great. Put a time constraint on it, and and I think one of the things that I do to that that I because I, I set this from like from the start, I set it up. Now what I do for me is I don't even talk to you on the phone. Like I, I'll talk, I'll spend five minutes with you on the phone. And go, oh, you want to talk about about radio or, or a deal later? Here's what I need you to do. I'm going to send you a link to my calendar, book a time slot that I have available, and then we can talk at that so time. So I would say I would say that super. Hey, two things. That's super advanced, right? Um, Everybody can set a time constraint. I think you know people got to put a couple years in and understand the stuff to be able to do that. I think the second thing is you know we deal with guys with a hundred million dollars, a billion dollars, guys managing eight billion dollars. If I send them to a link, they're going to say, "Hey, Orin, go fuck yourself." <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not going to a link yeah, at right. that time. We okay. get, right. I mean, yeah. with all respect. So, um, so I think let's focus on some basic tools okay. that anybody can do. So, so one is a time constraint. Just say, "Hey, got a lot to do." in a short period of time to accomplish this task that we need today, I've got like 15 minutes. And that should just feel on the short end of what we need to do, Okay. right? If it's a first meeting, for sure, hey, we gotta cut this just short of an hour, right? That's what, prof- any deal, $8 billion deal, first pitch, you know, gets pitched in 20 minutes and that meeting is short of an hour. These, so, so deal size doesn't matter. Uh, so the time constraint, for sure. The other thing is I'd like for everybody to get to a point where they feel like they can say no to the buyer. No, the, I would not do that. That's not something we would get involved with. Why would I ever do that? That communicating to the buyer very early on that you're winning, willing to walk away is something anybody can do. All right, uh, and Because when you, when you get to the end of the process, sales process, and then you communicate, that you're willing to walk away, it doesn't have as much teeth mm-hmm. as when you've done it four, five, six times along the way, right? And, and that's where we talk about framing. I know we're not going to get into that here, yeah. moral authority frame. But, but for example, um, you know, in the first meeting, it's very easy to say, listen, uh, I, well, well give, me a, give me a scenario that's most common for your um, you know, audience and listeners. Well, I think, uh, and I, I, instead of going down that route, yeah. Oren, so I think uh, like sort of a natural place to go here are, are two things. And I think the, I want to get to pricing, you yeah. know that, because that's really yeah. important. But I think, I think you're setting up this push-pull, right? So right. You, you can, do, yeah. there's lots of ways you can do this thing. So let's talk yeah. about, so, okay, we're not going to project neediness, um, and, and you're going to set time constraints, and you're going to start to pull back on the deal, right? So this is, pu- illustrate to everyone this push-pull notion that, that you talk about. Sure. So, I mean, how we got here is we're not giving false compliments. Oh, that's a beautiful suit. I don't know anything about suits. You know, I mean, we, I know, a little bit, but I don't, you know, uh, I'm not an expert in that. It would be a real compliment if, you know, my dad was a suit maker and sure. I knew suits, right? Uh, 
Uh, so we're not going to give false compliments. We're not going to try for rapport and connect the fact that your sister went to Northwestern and, and you know, someone in my family went there. So we're not going to do those things. We're not going to lean in you know, and let people know, give them your fax number and your phone number and you know, multiple ways to contact you. Yeah. Those are you know, real clear signs and neediest. We are going to constrain time. Mm-hmm. And, and, and uh, so now the, the thing we're talking about is letting the buyer know that he doesn't have us. He doesn't own us. Even though, right. Even, right, but even though we are, we are pitching him. We're, we're pitching, pitching we want, him. We want the deal, but, but right now I'm going to illustrate that, hey, I'm ready to walk away. If we're not a good fit, I'm ready to walk away from so this. So this is very nuanced, right? Absolutely. You can, you can really uh, confuse people. Mm-hmm. You can aggravate them. But in general, we want to have the ability to push them away, right, and then pull them back in. If you're always just selling and pitching and promoting, it's saccharine, it's sweet, it's sticky, and it's uncomfortable, and it doesn't feel authentic. So real relationships, friends, right, coworkers, they have push and pull, right? So if we're coworkers, and you come in, right, I'm not trying to sell you anything. You give a presentation. I go, hey, Toby, I like slides one through three. Four through five confused me, right? I think you need to go back and work on those. That would be a push, right? And then it feels like we're having an authentic, real conversation in a relationship. So it's the same thing with a buyer is you have to be willing to push him away, and that delivers authenticity to the relationship. And it makes it feel like you guys have a stronger relationship than if you're just selling. And so the way that works is to, uh, uh, you know, to, to say, hey, listen, um, I'm busy, right? I work with folks who um, you know, want to get their property listed and sold, right? So if you're go- the, way, the way I do it, and everybody that does it differently is we talk for a week, right? We look at the proposal for a week, and then over the next two days, we list it. It's sort of a timeline that most people uh, are comfortable with, right? If you need a month or two months to decide on a listing agent, it wouldn't be for me. Right. That would be a push that's reasonable and feels like we're having an authentic conversation, right? And then, the po- then once you've done that, then... You can, um, uh, you know, be a little bit needy and be a little bit sweet. You know, I like you guys a lot. You know, this is a beautiful property. This would be a great listing. I think I don't know you that well. There's another push. We got to learn a lot more about each other. But at face value, seem like sweet people. I think we could. We, we got a lot more to learn about each other than another push. But seems like um, we could accomplish a lot together. Why don't we do some basic things? Learn what your ability is to sell your property, what my ability is to get it out there, right? And if we like those couple of things that we've done together, then let's do an agreement, Yeah. right? Uh, but but we got to make sure it's on my timeline. Otherwise, I wouldn't. You see how many times I'm just pushing and yep. pulling? We're having, uh, you know, it's like we're having a conversation even though I'm doing all of it. And there, and there are varying degrees of there's light, medium, and hard push and pull. And I'll tell you one th- yeah. that I use in radio. So, so somebody calls me, get me on the phone. And and I let them and it's it's this is don't kill me here because I, I the yeah, process yeah. that I have historically found yeah, is yeah. not what you pr- promote. So I typically will get them on the phone. I'll go hold on before I tell you anything about me. Tell me I want to see if we're a good fit. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your team, how many transactions, how long, whatever. So they tell me, and then so I so again so I kind of I, I'm a, when I do that I'm establishing dominance. I'm establishing um, alpha position. Yeah. Um, as you talk about alpha beta. And then I go, okay, well, that's good to know, but you know, you're not our typical client. You know, typically, we want to see a team of 20, uh, 150 transactions, but you know what? I know you're in Orlando. We don't have anyone in Orlando. We might be willing to take a risk on you yeah. um, because I, I got to tell you, I don't want to bring you on because I can't have a, a loss on my record. Right. And all, flips a switch, all of a sudden, that person... This is a real story. I hope he's not going to... What? But, you know, that person starts saying, no, 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 hold on, man. I'm your guy. I will just tell me what to do. I'll do whatever. And then I'll say, well, can you put $50,000 in the bank and earmark it for this? Absolutely. I go, okay, if you can do that. So, 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 so that's, a, that's, that's a little bit of a more hard push. Well, <laughs> and, well I think, A, if it's authentic, yeah. you know, then it works. Yep. Right? Uh, and, and the other thing is you can do it. Even if it's sort of gamemanship, that's what, but the, the other people in your organization uh, who want to copy that um, could, if it's inauthentic, you know, could, 
communicate the inauthenticity. Mm. So yep. it's it's hard, but if it's authentic and true, then it works. Uh, and I think what we could do is put a takeaway underneath that, which is people want what they can't have. Yep. So if they just call up and say, "Hey, we were a team of twenty people." Um, we've done you know such and such transactions. We're interested in the service, and you go great. Sounds like we're a perfect fit. Let's price it out. We'll get a proposal out to you, right? You get then what they will do is say, "Aha, we have an option." Now let's go to the internet and look for a second option, right? So we can compress the pricing on it. So the second people have it, right? It's the same way you're surfing for a TV. You can't find it. You're you know you go the first one I find. Uh, I'll just buy it, right? Then you find it on Amazon and you go, okay, now I know it's $3,000. Where can I get it cheaper? Right. Right. And so that's how humans react to p- people want what they can't have. And the second you give it to them, they're going to price you down. Absolutely. I, I do that with flights all the time. I, you know, can, I, can I get to... Yeah, that's great. To, that's a great you know, metaphor. Right? And then I go, okay, I, oh, now I know it's 400 bucks. Let's see where else I... Okay. Yeah, so, so, so just stick on that for a minute, right? First, you're worried about getting to Miami, yeah. right? And you go, I don't care what it is, right? If I can just find a pl- private charter, right? It's $25,000, I'll take it because I have to be there for a meeting, right? Then you're surfing, you find a ticket for six. Remember, you were going to pay $25,000. Yeah. You find a ticket locked in and they go, this ticket's reserved for Toby for 48 hours. You go, okay, that's interesting, right? Let me see if I can get it down to 400 yep. and you keep surfing. Right. So, so that's exactly the same thing that happened with your deal. People want what they can't have. If you give it to them, then they'll say that's an option. Absolutely. Okay. So, so w- w- with my story, when I said, "Hey, you're not our typical client. We, you know, we, we typically work with team, you know, teams that are bigger than you, to, uh, more advanced, whatever." W- w- that's that's a it's prizing. So, and I think that's really important right. to okay, mit- mitigate your neediness and then establish yourself as the price, something they need to work for to, to get you. So this is so difficult for people to uh, grasp, but once they do, it's the most powerful thing that you can have. The way that most people, almost everyone, view the buyer-seller relationship is that we're the seller and we have to uh, win the buyer's business, right? So they have the prize of money that we're trying to earn. So we do all kinds of antics to earn the prize of their purchase order or of their money. That's right. So, so we view the, the buyer and the buyer's money as the prize that we have to win, right? And so we'll do almost anything to do that typically. But what if we shift that lens and say, you know what? There's lots of buyers out there. Yeah, they might not all be calling me, right? But these markets are huge, especially in these listing and real estate markets. They're massive. There's hundreds of buyers. You know, just, um, you know, they're in Brownian motion and moving around. But there's not a lot of agents like me. I'm honest. I work harder than all these other yo-yos who are part-time. I've been doing this a long time. I know my area. I study the pricing. I do the math. I don't think... There might be one or two other guys in my area who are as good as me, and I might be the best. And understanding that in your own mind and saying, you know what? If this guy lists with me, he will be so fortunate, right? Because I, the job I will do for him will be better than these other yo-yos. And, and so recognizing, uh, one, that you are more valuable in the relationship than some random buyer or lister is incredibly important, Right? Uh, and, and so once you understand that I'm more valuable than the buyer, now you're not chasing him, right? And you're letting him know that he doesn't, he can't just say, I'm going to list with you and automatically get you. You're evaluating him as much or more than he's evaluating you. And that's prizing. So if you want to explore that and, you know, and break that down. Yeah, let's, let's that's, do it. That's, that's the essence of it. If you just walk in and say, if you give me the listing, I'll take it and I'll be happy, Right. Um, uh, that that actually authentically could hurt you. There's lots of bad guys out there. You know, people who list their house but don't, won't actually sell it when you bring in offers. You know, to use that specific example, yep. people who lie about you know the the property and what work needs to be done on it, and uh, you know whether it's termites or whatever. Uh, there's there's uh, properties with all kinds of deeds and you know um, uh, liens and encumbrances and yeah. litigation yeah. issues. 
All right. So if somebody, if you walk in, have a good meeting with somebody, and they go, "Hey, I want to give you the listing." You take the listing. Could be the worst thing you've done for yourself in a long time. Use up all your time. Get you involved in litigation. Uh, um, discredit yourself with um, uh, you know the rest of the market. So you actually have to investigate and interview and think about if you're going to take that listing on. And you communicate that. Uh, uh, and so that's a sense of prizing yourself as more important than the uh, the buyer. Absolutely. So so in order to do that, right? So so number one, if you truly believe that that your skill set, what you do, like if you're the cure to cancer, okay, but realizing that time is not infinite, you only have so much capacity. Yeah. I'm the cure to cancer. I'm the, I'm I'm the your dream agent or whatever. I need to vet you. So you so again, what you're saying is. Relay that stuff, and, and again, I think I think if, if everybody's done what we've talked about earlier, some of this push pull, not being needy, yeah. and then and do that appropriately, and then get into pricing, that works. Yeah. Um, so so it, in what ways, you know, I, I know again, I've, your, your book pitch anything's fantastic. By the way, everybody, if you have not read pitch anything, I can tell you for me, it's very much changed the way that that I've looked at deals um, and, 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 and done my, my own pitch. So go get a copy. Um, and as you guys know, we work with Audible. You can go to audibletrial.com slash Live, and you can get uh, you sign up with Audible. They'll give you a free credit. Get Oren's book. Oren still gets paid on that. So get the book. Okay. Yeah, and I, I love the 90 cents that I make. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we afford all this. Oh, jeez. Jeez. Um, well, I think you're doing a good thing. I think you are adding value to the universe yeah. with, with – but and I got to tell you, man. I mean, well, I know we're going to get off track a little bit, but, but as I heard you – again, I've listened to your book twice, and I, it's, it's a fascinating book. I think you are super underrated as an author. And, and here's, here's why, Oren, is Tim Ferriss. You know who Tim Ferriss sure. is. Okay. Right. Tim's whole deal is he's taking the scientific approach to these, these things, right? Whether it's, whether it's uh, he's, he did the four-hour body, he did uh, the four-hour chef, all this stuff. And I think that's his claim to fame. He's all these people going, it's not just theory, it's science. And I think, I think yeah. if the world knew that you came at this from a scientific perspective, I think I think you would blow up, and I just I just don't think that. I, I think that's right. And uh, we're going to start sponsoring some science at UCLA, and you know some labs and some some social science. I will say, you know, Tim is interesting. It's a different perspective. So you pitch anything is a is not about um, finding guerrilla ways to do deals, right? If you th- so so Tim is sort of a guerrilla. Right? He's like, hey, I live out here in the fringe. You go into where the people live, and you steal some of their money, and then you run back into the forest. You know, you live on the on the fringe. His stuff is really fringe. I view what we do is sort of. If you think about a basket, an NBA basketball game, there's rules, right? And you got to play by those. And real estate is like that. You have you're overseen by all kinds of you know agencies, whether it's SEC or FINRA, um, or, you know, or certainly their real estate guidelines, their realtor um, uh, guidelines. You can't just do anything you want. There's a game with set rules, right? So the way I think about it is, how do you play? that game better than the other people, but play it fairly, honestly, truthfully, right? And, and so that's when you really win is when you don't find techniques and tactics mm. and tricks yeah. and workarounds. It's when you go straight up the middle, you plow ahead and you score, right? And you get – and you put points on the board or, or – um, so, uh, you know, pitch anything is about how you play better than the other guys in a – in the the game of real estate or the game of business. It's not about tricks, you know, and tactics. Um, right. So, so well, Zig Ziglar, you know, for example, had 99 <coughs> ways to, you know, 99 closes, you know, or 199 yeah. or 599 closes. We don't have any closes. I bet you really don't have a close. No. Right. You just, if you work harder at the beginning, yep. then you don't have to close hard. And it's funny. So, so when I pitch, um, I, I, you know, I, I do my thing, and I usually I go, well, you know, do you have any questions, specific questions for me? And normally those go, what's the next step? Right. And I go, okay, well, I'll send you the contract, you know, just sign it and write me a check, and we get going. That's so, my yeah. close. Uh, guys, what should we do? I'm running out of time. Yeah. Uh, well, how do we get an agreement in place? I go, I don't know. Talk to Cass. She'll figure it out. Yeah. Right? I, I just, like, you know, you do an agreement, we'll do the agreement, let's do some paperwork and figure it out. And they go, great, great, well, you know, we'll send it over to you this afternoon. That's the best close I have is I have to leave. You right. Know? And, and that's, now, you're going to be careful. You know, you have to do everything right up to that point. Uh, and once 
You've prized yourself. You're not needy. You've explained the value proposition clearly. You've pitched in 20 minutes, haven't, which, mo by the way, most people cannot do, right? And all your competition takes them an hour, hour and a half to get out what they have. If you can explain what you have in its entirety in 10 minutes, you're going to blow them all away, right? And so people recognize that quality. Uh, and then you go, hey, but I'm super busy. Let's figure out what we're going to do. And they go, how can we work with you? And you go, I don't even know. Talk to my assistant. She'll get it set up and see if we have time on the calendar. I don't know how you work with me. Somebody else figures that out. Yeah. But I have to go. So um, one of the things, I, I, again, I think you're right. You have to do all that stuff right. And I think in the right order, um, and again, one of the things that, with your book, it's helped me reorder my, how I do yeah, things. Yeah, order is very important. Um, and, I, and, and again, what you just said, and I want to re-say it, what you said was do all the hard work up front. So, I mean, most selling is sort of like an opera, or I'm sorry, or like, a, or like a, you go to the orchestra, right? It starts off with strings, nice and easy, and then it works up to this crescendo, right. boom, 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 right? So that's the close. And with you, you're like, hey, do, just give them all the value, like pack it right here in front, and then instead of working up to a crescendo, like you slowly work out, and then... So Here's what I think. Going back to the span of human attention, the most amount of attention that you have from somebody is when you walk into a room or get on the phone or get on the Skype. Reason is, is because the human mind is attuned to things that are move or dynamic. It doesn't pay attention to the road and the tree and the door and a wall because it's not moving. Right? But things that move exist in three dimensions and are physically dynamic. Right, are, are uh, animated, have, you have to pay attention to them because it could be a lion, it could be a tiger, it could be a snake. It might just be the rustling of the bush, but people who survived paid attention to things that move. So you move in a conference room and you get a lot of attention, success. Right? From once somebody determines that you are not a threat, they're not going to eat you, not going to mate with you, they're not going to be attacked by you or need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, then they start to calm down and pay less attention, right? And so attention declines precipitously from the first minute to the fifth minute and then again to the eighth minute. And by the 20th minute, um, most people are fading out, all right? So the most amount of attention is when you first start. That's when people are looking. They're hypervigilant. You know, are you uh, trustworthy? Are you not trustworthy? Are the things you say sound credible? Because uh, they're, they're paying lots of attention and trying to figure out if you're dangerous or safe. Okay, uh, so that I start my pitch. You know, you know some of my starts, which are, uh, hey guys, it's eleven o'clock. Let's get started. Does anybody need fluids in or out? If not, yeah. let's ramp this thing up. We got a lot to cover in a very short period of time. Unfortunately, we're you know very busy this time of year. I got other stuff to get to. Let's cover as much as we can as fast as possible and see if there's chemistry, if it's a relationship, and if there's anything else to do here. Unless there's any arguments, why don't you hold off right, on telling me about yourselves? We'll tell you what we have. Right? Uh, it'll take 15, 20 minutes at most, and then we'll talk about what you have and see if there's a fit. Sound like a good plan? Let's go. go. Yeah. So, but again, um, you cannot, you can't just... Uh, you, you can't just roll out with a bunch of facts and figures, features, benefits. You just can't do that. Right. And one of the things that in your book that you talk about that, that, that is fascinating to me, and I haven't quite figured out how to use it for me, is you talk about intrigue loops or intrigue right. cues, right? right? You can set up a story yeah. in the beginning, and then later, right, you, you know, and you keep them on the edge because they're like, oh, Orn got into this, into this mess, yeah. Right? And, and, and how is he going to get out of it? So that's how you keep their attention till the end. So, so let's talk a little bit about, about intrigue and how, how you use that and how you suggest people use it. Well, let, yeah, let's talk about what it is first okay. of all. So okay. uh, there's some uh, newspapers and magazines, uh, and uh, to me they fall, articles fall into two different uh, slots. One is from the headline, you know what happened. School bus uh, hits edge of road, falls over. 33 kids injured, driver dies, right? I tend to not read the rest of the article because I know what happens, right? Accident in Malibu, right? Um, uh, accident in Malibu going to affect the future of California schools. There, you know, I don't know everything that happened and it pulls me in, right? So in the same way, if you tell people what you have, 
what the price of it is, what the ROI is in the first 30 seconds in the first minute, uh, the presentation's done. All they want to know is the price, you know, and, and how low they can get your commission or yeah. whatever. Right? So it's got to have some intrigue or intrigue loops to keep people there all the way. We, started, we were talking about this yesterday. Did, uh, did you ever watch the series Lost? Yeah. Oh, my God. Right. Like, that was like intrigue loop after intrigue loop after intrigue loop. Like, it was sort of done to abstraction. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you, um, they left so many cliffhangers. So you want to be a little bit calm, but you want to leave many cliffhangers throughout the presentation. Um, uh, if you think about this, you and the humans around you pattern make. We, we yeah. have to pattern make. Right? Otherwise, yep. uh, we don't know how to cross the road. We don't know who's friend or foe. Uh, we don't know what when we go to the gym what works. We'd be constantly injured. Uh, you know, we don't know what food we like. So we wouldn't know how to make recipes. We wouldn't know how to do a single thing. Right? We would we would constantly be drunk because we wouldn't realize like four beer is you know there six is too many eight you know we go to the hospital. Like, human beings have to pattern make in everything. It's part of our we, we solve problems right and we want to we want to discover what the puzzle is. So. Once you start your presentation, the buyer is racing ahead of you trying to guess what the price is, what you're trying to say, or worse, if he's seen this presentation before, he's trying to pattern match it to yours and guess exactly what the outcome is because they're trying to save mental energy. That's what the human mind does. It wants to save energy. So if it can guess what your presentation is, what you're about, what you're going to say, it will, so it can shut down and think about other stuff related to sex and food and safety, right? Uh, so if what you're saying is not intriguing and if it doesn't have um, um, unfinished business, then the buyer's mind will shut down and not think about you or your offering anymore, right? So that's the, that's the, the basic underpinning. And I think your question was around sort of what are the tactics? Well, no, but training? hold on. I want to just unpack that a little bit yeah. or, or, or sum that up. So, so everybody's trying to make patterns, trying to figure out, connect the dots. Right. And what you're saying is once they connect the dots for right. whatever they want to know, right. how much is it, how fast, how, whatever, they're done. They're done. They're checked out. They're, 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 talking about, they're thinking about changing their oil or, or what they're going to eat tonight. Right. So everybody's trying to make patterns. Once they do it. It's over. Okay. So, so now again, what you and I, we're, we're, we got to we got to start wrapping up because I, yeah. I don't want to take too much time. Um, so now, and again, t- t- for this intrigue loop, I try to do it in the intro when I introduced yeah. you because I, what I wanted to say, and I think I forgot to say it because I thought about what I'd say to intro you. I wanted to say, you know, Warren's done this. He's figured out the formula, and over the next sixty minutes, he's going to reveal how. You know, I was going to do the reveal, right. and I think right. I forgot to say it. But, um, but again, so. When people go and do their pitch, leave some intrigue in there, leave something out. We talked about that earlier. Leave something out. And, and like, it's ter- in terms of a tactic, this is something people can use. Like, when they have a listing, they can, they're going to post it on Craigslist. They can put it on Craigslist, put the picture, 3,000 square feet, ocean view, but don't put the price in. Right? Leave so, that out. So those, and, and I think those are good, and those are advertising, you know, intrigue tactics. Um, I know less about that stuff, but in the inner, so if we take the listing, right, I might, if, and, and if I, uh, you know, maybe somebody's interested, in, has children, right? Say, listen. So th- intrigue is best characterized around change, right? The school system in San Diego is very dynamic. The city council has a whole series of rules that they're putting into place, right? In the time we have here today, I'm going to give you the basics of how the school system works, right? But it will take a longer meeting for me to show you how to get your kids into the school that you really want, okay? Strong. Yeah. Okay? Uh, that's an intrigue loop, and it's around – I. It, it does a lot of things, right? Um, I'm the expert in this. My status goes up. Right. Things are changing, right? Things, you know, things are dynamic and changing. I need a guide, you know. So they're going to cling on to me as the guide uh, in that case. I have information, um, and I'm able to put the information in context. And the most valuable people in this world are people who are able to explain what's going to happen and predict what's going to happen in the future. So if I say to you, I know what's going to happen in San Diego real estate over the next 18 months um, from a regulatory standpoint because I have friends on the committee, right? And 
it, um, they realized this year they were not asked to sign a non-disclosure. And so they can freely discuss what the committee meetings are. And we get together once a week and, we, and, and they tell me what is up for resolution and wh how they're going to vote. Right? And so I know what's going to happen in real estate from a uh, from standpoint. Then you want to spend as much time as possible. Right. And so a couple things. So, so number one, you've intrigued them because I want to know what you have. So number one, you've done that. Number, number two, and again, we don't have time to cover this, but you, know, you talk about alpha beta. You set, you've set yourself up. You've given yourself local star power right. that you talk about in the book, you, and then that gives you alpha status. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, okay. So again, right. got to start wrapping. I'm going to switch gears. Now, I always ask for book recommendation. I, I, we've plugged your book. Everybody should get it. But what does somebody like you read, man? Yeah. Like, so so uh, I get tons of books. <laughs> I'm sure you but, do. Yeah. Uh, you know, we flip through them, and, and most of them are written so quickly, you know, and so poorly. There's not a, a ton of stuff out there. Um, the, the book I, I like is um, a by uh, a professor at Harvard Business School, Competitive Advantage. Hmm. It's somewhat technical, right? But it um, explains what uh, firms that have a real advantage over their competition really have and how to think about what, uh, um, how to look at a company and, and understand its competitiveness. So I love that book. Hmm. Uh, let's see, the cast, what other books do we have? That that um, I'll tell you what. And we, normally we just ask for one, yeah, but I'll so tell that, you. What. So that's one competitive competitive advantage, and its sister book, competitive strategy. Great books. The profit zone. Oh, the profit zone. Great book. Never heard of it. Yeah. You know, it's a, you know, it's a book uh, that it's I love. Guys at uh, Boston Consulting. Great book. The profit zone. It's it's um, really breaks down how companies make money, right? So so people will say to you all the time, "Oh, my buddy's a company. He makes thirty million." Well, does he gross 30 million? Does he net 30 million? Does he personally make 30 million? Most of the time when I hear that, I don't, they could be broke, he could be losing money. Yeah. So when you think about the profit zone, it helps you break down what companies are actually doing in specific finance terms. Great. And it's amazing, you know, it's amazing on that. I, 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 a few years ago, I had a buddy who's a chiropractor, and we're at, we're at a party, and he was, felt like he was big stuff. Yeah. And he's like, uh, you know, and then that year, I had I paid taxes on 986. I made a million bucks, like, yeah. legitimately. And he throws his wallet down, and he's like, I made $720,000 last year. I'm like, hold, hold on, what are, you, what are you talking about? And yeah. I, that's, that's what his top line was. And I get it. Yeah, made is not a finance term. <laughs> right? Right? I, finance I, terms are uh, uh, top line revenue, uh, gross margin, operating costs, net income, NOI, EBITDA, EBITDA yeah. right? Those are finance terms that I can understand as a banker, right? right? And you can understand as a, a, you know, as a real estate professional, but made, did, has, yeah. those things are meaningless. I hear you. Anyhow, okay, that's, that's, that's good. So, so um, do you, Oren, do, do you have a personal habit that, that you think has contributed to your success? Uh, sure. I think we talked about it today. Is, okay. Is and I learned it from uh, my partner who was in real estate. Is and and maybe this could be called you know spite you know cut your nose to spite your face, but um, we don't compromise our integrity in deals. I'm uh, you know in a deal I am not going to compromise myself to go when we will say no and walk away, right? And so that will hurt you sometimes. The ability to say no and walk away and the willingness to do it. Even when you could win the deal, it to me is critical. You're going to lose some stuff. You're going to lose some money, right? You you know those people. It might be yourself. You know, listening. You chase every deal to the point of absolute certainty. Win lose. Walk away from stuff when it feels hazy, sketchy, fuzzy, furry. Even though you might win it and it might be a good deal, say no early and often. It's going to cost you money. But that ability to have that self respect. Will communicate. Will you know? Everybody else will pick up on it and be more likely to do deals with you. Yeah. The ability to say no and walk away to me is the critical skill that I think changed everything in my life. That's great. And I think I think I think you touched on something again. We don't have time to go. But like I did a deal. I did a deal two years ago. Actually, right in this neck of the woods. And I ended up losing four hundred and fifty grand of my money. Yeah. Not my one of my of my money. And. And the terms were so attractive, but like my gut the whole way said something wrong. And I should have, I should have, and I think this goes back, this very much could tie in your book with the whole crock. I should have trusted myself and I didn't. I, I was like, I'll, 
the terms look great, you know, but I couldn't explain, you know, it's going to feel, I'll never do a deal like that again. Anyhow, so, okay. So, so for sure, be willing to say no early and often. Get some self-respect. Well, you don't need the money that, right? What do we need the money for, right? We live in San Diego. We got the beach. We got some kids. We got cars. They go to school. We eat at Whole Foods. We need, a, you know, an extra million dollars for what, right? What you need is happiness, integrity, the ability to look in the mirror, the ability for your friends to respect you, uh, for, for, for you to, to, to know that um, you know, you're doing deals with integrity because the money is not important. Don't chase stuff. Say no. Let it come to you. Do deals that make sense where the chemistry and the money uh, it will organically come together and be a high-quality deal. Get rid of the, the, the stuff that looks too good to be true. Yeah, absolutely. So, so everybody... Go get pitch anything. It's fifteen bucks. How much is it? I mean, it's like it's like less than twenty bucks. And yeah. you get it on Audible. You can listen to it over and again. Um, I read it. I listened to it twice. Um, Orrin also has a couple products he has. You can go to pitchanythingedge.com, and he's got a ninety-seven dollar product. Uh, I bought it. I don't know if I told you. I bought it. Yeah, um, yeah. So and then there's another one. So just go go. What what I suggest you guys bet on yourself. Invest in yourself. It's not going to hurt you. Learn something. Thanks for tuning in, Orrin. Thanks so it's much, been man. Great. I, very good. Very Appreciate good. it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, man. Excellent. Let's go. Yeah. For those of you that want to know what we're all about, it's like this, y'all. This is 10% luck, 20% skill, 15% concentrated power of will, 5% pleasure, 50% pain, and 100%. Okay, are you there? Who hung around? All right. Uh, well, thanks for hanging around. I'm going to pitch you. I'm going to tell you how I pitch. I wrote this pitch today. Now, if you listen to, you know, what Oren, you know, all the stuff we talked about, you know, it's, uh, you know, intrigue loops. Uh, we want to we want to do some prizing. Uh, you make us the prize. You know, there's lots of deals out there. There's only one me kind of a thing. Uh, develop wanting and not be needy. All right. So <clears throat> here's my pitch. And just to set the stage, imagine that uh, that uh, you and I got on a phone call. You're interested in radio because I'm pitching radio. I'm pitching media. Um, um, or I showed up at your office, right? So we, I, I'm, I'm now walking up to the front of the room. Do you know the time differential between... Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hey, guys. Thanks so much. I'm so glad that we can carve out a few minutes together uh, to talk about your business and how radio might be able to help it. Um, and I want you to think of your business in this way. Do you know the time differential between a, the Olympic gold medalist and the silver medalist in the 100 meter? Fractions of a second. It's literally fractions of a second that determines the winner and the loser. We see this in sports all the time. We hear phrases like, he won by a nose, he won by a hair. The point is, the difference between first and second, winner and loser, are so slight that most people won't even recognize them. We, we specialize in these edge cases. We've taken the art of buying media and turned it into science. We have deconstructed every single piece of what goes into buying radio and creating a winning campaign. We've categorized it, we've weighed it, and we've valued it. Our exclusive method and model is designed for minimum inputs and maximum outputs. We create campaigns different than anyone else. Look, I gotta tell you, buying media effectively is hard. I'm not talking about just throwing something against the wall and seeing it worse. I'm talking about buying media effective and efficiently. Look, there's online, there's offline, there's mobile, there's desktop. Certain media is for branding and other media is meant for people to take action. Call your phone and get the cash register ringing. Look, there's lots of choices. There's print, there's radio, there's TV, there's Facebook ads, there's pay-per-click. All these channels have different sales cycles and all of them have different ROIs. Buying media in today's landscape is not a job for amateurs. Look, you need to know the metrics that you're optimizing for. Is it CPMs? Is it CPPs? And if by chance you fumble around and get that right, then you need to know how to natively, natively communicate the right message 
to achieve what we call market message match. You need to have the right copy length, correct placement, and compelling calls to action. Our team has spent years developing our exclusive method and model. What used to be an art form, we've turned into science. We know the formats that work. We know the demographic that buys, or in this case, sells. And most importantly, we know the CPP, the cost per point thresholds that will give you the best return. Before we air a single spot in the market, we spend two to five weeks doing deep research to identify the best station, the best day part. We negotiate the best rates and ad placement. If you get these pieces right, you'll make a lot of money. Get them wrong and you're lighting your money on fire. Look, right at this point, typically I get a few questions like how much does it cost? How long before it starts working? And, you know, what kind of ROI should I expect? Look, I'm happy to answer all those things. But before you and I spend a bunch of time together going back and forth, I need to tell you, we don't work with just everyone. We only work with people that have the right team size, but also that we feel can be good long-term partners. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Why do you think we should work with you? That's it. That's my pitch. I didn't time it. Let me see what time it is. So that's a four-minute pitch. Now, again, going back to go, – that, that is my pitch. Now, going back to what Oren says, that's not the length of the meeting. You know, what I did was was hopefully wet your whistle for, for radio. I wanted to get across the point that we're special. I wanted to kind of prize us. You know, we've taken – we've made a, a, what used to be an art form. We've turned it into a science. Um, hopefully, I've, I've uh, given you some, some, uh, some notion that, hey, listen – it's hard to do. There's lots of things to think about offline, online, mobile, desktop. Um, you know, there's lots of different channels. Um, so hopefully at this point you go, oh, crap. Maybe I didn't think about all those channels. Maybe I didn't think about how to properly create a, a mix with my, with my marketing budget. Um, uh, you know, and again, I think so. Uh, hopefully again, I, I wasn't needy. I created wanting, I prized a little bit, um, and hopefully at, at this point, and I did, look, I gave this pitch today, and I said, listen, we don't work with any, but just everybody, you know, why don't you tell me why, you know, we should work with you, and the guy started selling me, he, he started selling me on why he was a, a good fit for us, um, so, so uh, for you guys, you know, you guys spent a lot of time prospecting to get up to bat, um, and I don't know what your closing ratio is, but, but ideally, you know, you, you, everybody can, there's improvement for everybody. So I want you guys to, to think about your pitch. How do you pitch it? I don't want you guys going out there getting a listing appointment and just saying, oh, we're the best. And I, I mean, I hear these stupid pitches all the time. We're the best. And hey, um, when I list your house, it's going to syndicate out to 18 gajillion different sites. Yeah, so what? Everybody's doing that. So be a little bit different. Um, I would love to, uh, I would love to, um, I don't want to, I don't want to do a whole bunch of work, but I'd love, if you think you have a great pitch, uh, 